spinning. There we go. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. So good to be here. Welcome everyone online to uh, Truth on the Web Ministries and Church of God at Woodstock's weekly Sabbath sermon series. It's a pleasure to be here. And as the opening slide would seem to imply, I got to stay on the screen there. There we go. Um, this is the beginning of a series that I plan doing on the two epistles or letters of Peter. So the word epistles didn't fit well on the thing. So I used the word letters, so same difference. So, <laughs> um, so it probably is going to be five parts total. So this is the first part here. Um, and we're going to cover Peter himself and his audience, the audience that he was writing to when he wrote, especially the first epistle, the first letter. So before we dive into that, you may notice that the, the his is capitalized, and it is intentional, of course, because while Peter was the one that dictated though the letters to the scribe that wrote them down, um, they're from God. They're his letters. They're, they are his words to the saints. So it's not Peter's words. They're not things that clever things that Peter came up with. And as he kind of even says here in his second epistle here, he says that they had not followed cunningly devised fables. These weren't just like these are neat stories you want to tell people to help, you know, people learn good morals or or secret knowledge. It didn't have anything. And he also, um, in in the first chapter of his second epistle, also talks about that the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In that case, there he was talking about the prophets of old, but it also applied to Peter as he dictated these these letters. Um, he was he was inspired by the spirit. I don't have I didn't dig into it um, as far as I don't have any slides or anything on it. But one of the things that has come up of recent in the last hundred years or so is questions as to whether Peter really wrote these two epistles or not. And one of the main objections to that fact is that, well, Peter was just an ignorant fisherman. He wasn't educated. He wasn't, you know, that he was a fisher. How could he write this sophisticated, nuanced set of letters to people? How could he possibly do that? It must not have been Peter. My question, first and foremost, is that have you not read Scripture at all? Peter was transformed. And first and foremost, it's not Peter with these words anyway. These are God's words. So just as Moses was, oh, I, I, I can't speak very well. God said, I made the mouth, I made the tongue, don't worry about that. I'll put my words into your mouth and you will speak them. So the idea that Peter did not write these epistles is only from the enemy. It just is only from the enemy. Now, ultimately, if it's God's word, it really does not matter who, what human being actually spoke them. If it's truly the word of God, it doesn't matter if Peter dictated them or not. So that, that isn't, but the point that is being made when people try to bring into question Peter's authorship of these letters is the reliability of the Word of God itself. It's like, well, if if that's wrong, if it says Peter wrote these epistles, but Peter didn't, so that's wrong, then what else in here is wrong? So they begin to try to call everything into doubt, and that's just from the enemy. That's just from the enemy. So I wanted to point that out um, and, and just read a couple verses there. I'm not going to emphasize that much, but... These are his words. They are God's words that we that Peter dictated to his scribe and that got passed along. And God has also been the one through hands of other men and women throughout the centuries that has preserved the words that were originally dictated by Peter for us in this generation to be able to, to read and to hear and to speak of and to be edified by. So the first part is I'm going to read some stuff out of what we have, material that we have about who is Peter? Who is this guy, Peter? So Peter actually, other than Jesus himself, is by far the most spoken of person in the Gospels. Peter is mentioned all in all four Gospels a lot, a whole lot, uh, much more than any of the other disciples or anyone else. So I find that interesting. I think it's just because of who Peter was and how God was using him. So let's take a look here, kind of as Peter comes on the scene per se. There's a few different gospel accounts of this. I think this one captures a good bit of stuff. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. We've got 4 through 7 on the screen here. So now when he had left, he, Jesus had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. 
And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and they should, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. So a lot of fish, a whole lot of fish. So Peter's contention here was, well, we were out there all night. And so the, the, to set the scene up a little bit here, they'd been out fishing all night and had not caught anything, really. And then Jesus, they, they'd come to shore, and Jesus says here, got, Jesus got into Peter's boat and said, go out a little bit so I can speak to the people. So Jesus addressed the people from Peter's boat just a short distance from the shore. And then after he got finished speaking, that's where he told Peter, all right, now I want you to go out in the deep and throw in again. And Peter's kind of hesitant. He's like, well, we did it all night. We didn't get nothing. But if you say so, fine, I'll do it. So we can infer from Peter's response coming up here that Peter had some doubt and perhaps some resistance in his heart when Jesus told him, I want you to go do this. Because here, after Peter saw what happened, his reaction is, I think, great. So when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter realized, who was I to doubt? I mean, you said to do it. Why would I even, why was I concerned about it? For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draw to fishes, which they had taken. And, uh, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. And there are several places where it talks about you won't be fisher, you'll be fishers of men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. So here in this case here, Andrew and Peter and the, the sons of Zebedee all followed him. They essentially forsook everything and followed him. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's incredible. How many of us think most people that encountered Jesus did not have that same reaction? Many, many, especially the religious, resisted him, and some followed him for a while, and then they quit following him. But Peter and Andrew and James and John, in this case here, who were their business partners, um, they forsook everything and followed him. A little side note, um, in verse 4 previously, where Jesus, so they were, they were just a little while offshore when, when Jesus was preaching, and then Jesus got out of the boat, and he told Peter to go out into the deep. So some have taken that um, and used that as topic, and I think it's interesting topic this sermon. It's like, Jesus is like, don't play it safe. Don't just be here by the shore. Go out into the deep and do what you're supposed to do. I'm with you. Be faithful. Don't be fearing. I don't think that's necessarily what was being said there, but it's interesting. Many of these verses, as I was reading them, my mind would harken back to different sermons and things that I've heard about them and you and as they as being topics. And sometimes people take license, but there's a lot of meat in all of this stuff that we take for granted. I mean, we all know the story, I'm sure. We're familiar with it. But just think about Peter, who he was and what he's doing here. Let's take another example of, out of Peter's life here, out of Matthew, chapter 14. We've got verses 26 through 31 here. So this is the when Jesus is walking on water, and they're in the boat. And it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out of fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Again, this is a story that we're all familiar with, but there's some really interesting elements here. First, their first reaction is they see someone walking on the water, and that, that would in the middle of a storm, so that would catch me also as something is very odd. And their reaction is, oh, it's a spirit, or it's a ghost, or it's something supernatural. So while we, we think that back in the day they didn't have those kind of thoughts or beliefs, obviously they did. Obviously, that was one of the, the, the ways they looked at the world is that there's supernatural stuff going on. 
And then Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. And so then Peter is still doubtful. He says, well, if it is you, and I'm not sure if Peter wanted to walk out on the water or if this was a test for the, the spirit, the potential spirit to prove that it was actually Jesus, this might have been a test that Peter was throwing out there. Hey, well, if it is really you, then let me walk out to you. Bid me to come out to you to prove that it really is you. So he asks, if it is you, then bid me come. And so Jesus says, come. And then Peter walked on the water. And then we know the rest of the story here. Uh, Peter began to doubt. He saw the, the, the tumult of the sea and everything and got afraid. We can understand that as a human being, being in that situation. And he began to sink. But I think one of the best things out of this story, and there certainly have been sermons preached on this, is the reaction that Jesus had. Jesus didn't like say, oh, well, you made your own trouble. You know, you quit believing, so go ahead and drown. No, at the moment that Peter's, even in the midst of his lack of faith, his little faith, he screamed out for help, and Jesus reached out and pulled him up. And I think that's probably one of the greatest things in this story. So this is the same Peter. Let's take a look at some more things that are attributed to Peter in the Gospels. John chapter 6, verses 67 and 68. Then Jesus says unto the twelve, Will you also go away? This is when many had fallen away after not understanding what Jesus was talking about with the bread and the wine, and his body and such. Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So this is from God. Peter understood. He didn't have the spirit yet at this point in time, but he understood. We run, and it's not the same situation, the same circumstance or occurrence, but a similar response from Peter we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, or 15 through 17. And Jesus says unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Same Peter, the same one that had lack of, you know, lack of faith, little faith that sank in the water. This is the same, but the, he's also the same one that, that doubted when Jesus told him to go out into the deep and cast in the net. And it's also the same Peter that walked on water. And none of us have done that, I'm sure. I don't think so. Probably you would have told me of that had that happened. I have not. So, same person. And again, just to emphasize who Peter was, just a few verses later, right after this wonderful testimony, blessed art thou, Simon of Barjona, flesh and blood has not re revealed this, but my Father, which is in heaven. We read here in verses 21 through 23, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. This is the same Peter saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, he wasn't calling Peter Satan here, but the spirit by which Peter was speaking was of Satan. It was contrary to God. I don't think necessarily that Satan was whispered in Peter's ear that to say this, but it was the satanic spirit, the evil, the, the adversarial spirit against God that Peter was speaking of. So, so we see here that this man, Peter, while he was very zealous, he also was prone to do some foolish things. Another example similar, this is uh, in Luke 22, 31 through 34. And the Lord said, unto si uh, Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So it's the same Peter that we see is kind of, can be back and forth, hot and cold, it seems like, based on what we read there. I think it's dangerous to infer too much about what his personality was like or who, who he really was. For example, we know that, Peter had a mother-in-law. It actually never says that his wife was still alive. We assume she probably was, but maybe not. Did, did Peter have any children or not? We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us that. 
Did, were his were his parents? What about his mother and father? Were they still around? Or well, we don't know any of that stuff. The scripture does not tell us, even give us a hint of any of that whatsoever. And and in general, if you were writing a biography of something, of someone, those are the kind of facts that you would include in there. Pretty basic facts, you know. He he was married to to Miriam for this long, and then she died, and then he was married to to Judas for this long, or whatever it was. Those are the kind of things. So Scripture does not give us those. And in fact, as I said, Peter in the New Testament, we probably have more background information, not as a, um, a result of it telling us about him, but just accounts of what he actually did, that we can get an idea of how he reacted in different situations. So here's another one here where it says, Satan has desired that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Oh, you have little faith, the one that sank in the water. He says, I pray that you your faith fail not. And when you were converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. So Peter's reaction here is, again, one of, I would never, ever think about betraying or denying you. I would never do that. So to me, this is one of the things that always cautions me about my own heart. It's like, I, don't, don't trust my own conviction about, oh, I know this, I believe this, I don't believe that, I'm going to do this. Don't trust my own conviction. Because... I'm sure Peter was absolutely sincere when he said this. He wasn't trying to, I don't think he was even trying to put on a show. Other, other times when this kind of thing happened, it talked about the other apostles also said the same thing. So Peter wasn't unique in this, but I, I think he meant it. I mean, it's the same as a, a drunk wakes up in the morning and means, I'm never, ever doing that again. I, I, I don't know how many times I had that. I meant, I meant it with every single fiber of my being. I meant it. And yet, I found myself doing it again and again. So this is just, again, a warning to me that my reliance cannot be upon my conviction. It has to be upon him. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Shortly after this happens, we read here in John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, as Jesus is being betrayed in the garden, and the Pharisees had brought their guards to seize Jesus and turn him over to the Roman authorities. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the, the sheath. The cup with my, which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? So here we see Peter. So <sighs> taking a sword to somebody is not an easy thing to do. I mean, that's not, it's not something that you just hopefully lightly do. <laughs> um, it's a big deal. So Peter, again here, very zealous, but very misguided in his reactions. I'm not in any way sitting here talking bad about talking down as Peter is a bad example that I would never do that. Certainly, I doubt that I would have fared anywhere near as well as Peter did uh, in these circumstances. But just think about the man Peter. This is the man that, you know, when when he when he resisted the 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 unction to go out and cast in the deep, and then when he realized his error, he just he was in tears, like, oh, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. The same one that knew, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. The same one that said, no, I'll never let anybody do that to you and was rebuked by Jesus. The spirit which you speak of is not of God, but of man. It's of Satan. Don't do that. So, and in fulfillment of the prophecy that we just read out of Luke on the previous slide. Let's go to Luke 22, verses 55 through 62. We've got 55 through 59 on the screen. And so when they had kindled a fire, so this is, we know the story from my ear with this. So, he, so Jesus is now in custody, and Peter is there in the crowd and waiting to see what would happen. So in the midst of the hall, and we're set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied, saying, Woman, I know not him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, 
thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, confidently um, affirmed, <coughs> saying, of a truth, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Carrying on, Peter says, man, I know not what you sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock grew. The next verse, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. So I do not believe that the look on Jesus' face was one of condemnation whatsoever, or I told you so, or thanks a lot, buddy. I really appreciate your help in my hour of need. It was one of love and understanding and compassion. And we see Peter's reaction. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny him thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter, in this case here, did not need to be further chastened or chastised or corrected about what he had done. He knew what he had done. It was already sufficient. If Peter was going to be pricked as a result of this, his actions, he had everything that was needed for that. So there was no need here in this case here to pour salt in the wound whatsoever. And, and while this is the same, of course, we understand that this is the same Lord that just shortly before had, re, had said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter and the spirit that was coming out of his mouth. This is a perfect example of the atmosphere that, that Jesus must have had with his disciples where he wasn't timid whatsoever when they strayed. He wasn't, he, he didn't, he wasn't mealy-mouthed. He pointed out exactly, get, no, that's wrong. Don't do that whatsoever. But at the same time, it was an environment, the culture that he had developed where in a moment when they realized they were wrong, all they had to do was scream out, Lord, pull me up, help me. I think there's a lot of parallels between Peter's reaction right here and Judas's reaction when he realized what had happened. Because when you read how when Judas, it seems like Judas didn't fully understand what they planned on doing to Jesus when he turned him in. Because that's when he went back and he says, oh, I didn't know you were going to do that. Here's your silver back. And that's when that's not our problem. That's your problem now. So this, I think, is Peter's Judas moment where his heart, he's like, he has denied the Lord. He has denied him three times and he is bitterly convicted about it. Now, Judas went and committed suicide as a result of his bitter pain that he was suffering. And we can't look into Judas's heart but it seems like Judas Moore was concerned about his, what he had to lose. Whereas I believe Peter here was earnestly convicted about having let his Lord down because he loved Jesus. He loved him very much. So I think at this point here, Peter stands on the precipice and he could have just been another bad example. Now we know prophecy said that that wasn't going to happen. But nonetheless, here we have it. Peter is a man and he has done these things and he is... He is bitterly weeping, and he is terrified as far as what he has done. And I think that that idea is somewhat evidenced here as we read in Mark. At the tomb, where they're there at the tomb, and the two men, the angels, tell the woman, and he said unto them, Be not affrightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, and he shall and he as he said unto you. So he kind of identifies Peter here specifically because I think Peter was off. He wasn't even around them anymore. He was so ashamed of what he had done that he was hiding out. I don't know what that dark hour of Peter's soul was going on, but I believe it really was a a, a moment where it could have turned and he could have just ended it. He was. He was, he was weeping bitterly. But here is the spirit of our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he sends his, his servant and says, look, go after him. Go reach. Okay, so I know he's crying in the dark. He's about to go under. Let me pull him up. And it does seem like, um, although it isn't other than that verse, it isn't revealed in the Gospels, it does seem like that um, the risen... Christ revealed himself to Peter first. There's a couple verses, one out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 5, where Paul here says, 
For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again, and the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, Peter, then of the twelve. So it seems to separate Peter out as he went to him first. <clears throat> and here we see, yes, the women, there were some, so yes, but so. Uh, Luke 24, verses 33 through 35. This is the road to Emmaus, and they wrote the Emmaus, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, because they had seen him on the road. But then they go on to say, And hath appeared to Simon or Peter. So again, here it seems to be that because the other ones hadn't seen him yet. So he had appeared to Simon, Peter, and he had not appeared to the other the other disciples. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. So it seems like, again, God took special measure because of Peter, what Peter had done. Peter had denied him. Peter felt horrible, I'm sure, as a result of that. And so God went after the lost sheep. Just like he had prayed, to, just like Jesus had prayed to the Father, that after you're sifted like wheat, that you be converted and then you strengthen your brethren. Now I believe that Jesus would have done that for any of his disciples or any of his lost sheep whatsoever. But it's a great example. Many of us would have written Peter off at that point and what he did. I mean, I tell you, in another gospel, it talks about he did it with a curse. It's like, I didn't, I don't know him. I never met him. But God's ways are not men's ways. And so these things we see, these aspects of Peter, yes, but not so much of Peter, but these aspects of who our Heavenly Father is and who our Savior is, we see painted well in how he treated Peter that we may not otherwise understand as well. So Peter is an example of how God is merciful and loving, and he doesn't want any to perish. So from going from terribly ashamed and running away and hiding in bitter tears to shortly after he has risen. We read here in John 21, verses 1 and 4. And after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples in the Sea of Tiberias. And on, he, on this wise, he showed himself. Skipping down to verse 4. But when the uh, morning was now come, Jesus stood at the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So Jesus at the shore, the disciples are out in a boat. So this is the same Peter that was, he ran away and hid in shame not too long ago. But because of the reconciliation that God had done with Peter and brought him back into the fold, look at how Peter's reaction is transformed here. Therefore, the disciple that Je whom Jesus loves says unto Peter, it's the Lord. They saw the man on the shore. They didn't know who it was. John tells Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his father's coat on him. And he cast him. So he just like he was so excited to see him, he jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore to see him. And then he goes on to say, the rest of them rode in because they weren't very far out. But this this reaction is not the, this is the the difference between the reaction of running away in shame and bitter tears and the reaction of joy because of the reconciliation that had happened that he had been converted. So we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and look at this. What did, what did Adam and his wife do in the garden? They sinned. They denied him. They denied him. That's what they, they denied him. And when, when they heard his voice, they hid. Same as what Peter did. Peter ran off in bitter tears and hid. But in the same fashion that God in the garden reached out to them, and they denied and continued to defend their action, say, oh, it was the, you know, the woman that you gave me. It was the serpent's fault. Peter heard his words and he repented and turned and he was reconciled. And that's open to all of us, both when we were not his whatsoever and had never been his. And also if we find ourselves in a situation where we have denied him and we are ashamed, which we should be if that happens, praise God that we are, but we don't have to stay ashamed of it. We can turn to him and ask for forgiveness and he will heal us.
So we begin to see a stark transformation of Peter and who he is. He was almost at the, he was at the nadir of his life, ready to, to end it in misery and shame. But yet he, God reached out and he heard God's call and he jumped out of the boat and swam to him, essentially, metaphorically. We also know this here just a little bit later in John 21. The feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, follow me. Injunction given to Peter. Again, why Peter specifically? Some would take this to say Peter had a special place in the apostles. I don't believe that. I think this is what Peter needed, and God knew what Peter needed. And then the transformation really begins here. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, we see here after Jesus ascends after the 40 days, and it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them, Jesus, uh, that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So there isn't much up to this point in regards to what the other disciples' reactions to Peter's stuff was. When, when Peter would speak out, did they mock him? Did they make fun of him? Did they roll their eyes? Oh, there goes Peter again. We don't know. It does not talk about that whatsoever. We know that they often, they did have squabbles amongst themselves about, oh, who's the greatest and who's going to, you know, I'm going to sit at your left hand and your right hand and things like that. Um, Jesus rebuked them and says, you're not supposed to lord over each other like the Gentiles do. You're supposed to serve each other. So we can assume that there probably was some, some bickering going back and forth. And, and maybe Peter showed off sometimes because he thought he was a big shot. We don't know. It doesn't, scripture does not tell us that. We could read that in there, but we could read it mistakenly. So I think we should always be careful. You know, in, uh, in John chapter 13, on the foot washing, when Peter says, oh, not my feet only, but my head and everything else too, was Peter trying to be a big shot there? Or <coughs> we don't know. It doesn't tell us that. So we can't read that into it. But what we can know is that after this happens, we begin to see that when Peter spoke, the disciples listened. They, had, they heard what he said <coughs> because Peter had been changed. And so here, for example, even before the Spirit being fully poured out and a few verses after this, we see and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names, there are about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So he lays out the plan of we have to replace Judas, draw the lots. So Peter, again, they begin to listen to Peter, what Peter says. And not only, not only the disciples, but the people as well. In Acts 2.14, this is the, the, the Pentecost sermon. This is Peter. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, so they were all there, but Peter is the one that spoke, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. This is a completely different Peter. And people listen now to him. Now, well, I'm not going to get into it really much, but Peter was not the leader of the church. It seems that James was. The, if there was an official, like a leader, one that ultimately had to decide when there was a disagreement or whatever, it seems James was the one that that, that role fell upon. But Peter, from this point on, regardless of whatever opinion they may have had of him amongst themselves previously, now, by the Spirit, Peter was filled with the Spirit and wielded the ability to speak, and people heard what he said, and rightfully so, because some of the things he said were amazing. Um, so I'm just going to read through a few of them here in Acts. Like, for example, Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. But this is the same, same Peter. It's amazing. Uh, Chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, as they're taken before the authorities and interrogated as a result of that man being healed. And when they had set them in the midst, John and Peter, they asked, 
By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Those are some. So, Jesus' prayer, Satan hath requested to sift you like wheat, but I have, I have prayed that when you are converted, you strengthen your brethren. Well, what's he doing here? He's strengthening the brethren in ways that you could never even imagine that St. Peter, this being the St. Peter. Now, we are aware that at some point in time, there was some contention which appeared to be very short-lived between Paul and Peter, where Peter was in the wrong. We read about that in Galatians chapter 2. But that really is, and we don't know really any details about what all happened there. But other than that, we don't read of any examples of Peter being the same Peter that he was before, who was brash and he would just, he was reactionary and he would act without the spirit, none whatsoever. In fact, his statements here and his boldness, inspired and, and empowered by the spirit, are very strengthening and encouraging. Not only did he speak strong words, but he had insight by the spirit as well into things we read here for example in acts chapter 5 verse 3 but peter said ananias why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land well, how did peter know this well god obviously by the spirit had revealed this to him we read a similar thing in acts chapter 8 verse 20 this is with simon magus but peter said unto him your money perish with you because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Actually, the next verse digs into it even more. It's like, you have no part with this. Peter knew because the Spirit had told him. Peter was filled with the Spirit and it had given him insight. Let's take a look at one more example that we can read about Peter. In Acts chapter 15, we'll read verses 6 to 11. Got 6 through 9 on screen here now. So I've obviously skipped a lot of, I mean, there's a whole bunch more in the Gospels and in the book of Acts um, where we could talk about Peter and what he had done. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, Know ye how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. But put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And carrying on to verses 10 and 11. Now, therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So these words, and, and this, this, this idea that the Jews and the Gentiles' path to salvation was identical and the same, that Peter voices here by the Spirit, is woven all the way through both of his epistles. And we're going to look at that. So this essentially is the, the T which Peter sets up from which he launches his epistles. This idea that God put no difference between us and them whatsoever. And again, as we read here, through, if we read the rest of chapter 15 in Acts, you see that they heeded Peter's words here. And James stood up and said, yes, what Peter said, we agree with that. And as a result, let's take this action. They listened to Peter. So while Peter obviously had the ear of the disciples, it does not appear, as I'd said, that he was the leader. And I say that because there are, there are denominations that make Peter to be the superior apostle 
the one that was in charge, the Pope in, in some cases. And Scripture does not bear that out. It doesn't have evidence of that whatsoever. There's no, there are no examples where Peter is really put up. While he was listened to, he was filled with the Spirit, and he was very wise, and he was listened to. He did not, he was not the leader. So I want to take a look at a couple things that are talked about Peter extra biblically. So it's not even really a word, but first, uh, one of, one of the traditions uh, about Peter is that uh, he was crucified in Rome. Some say upside down. Some say in Rome. So we do know that Peter did die, but Scripture doesn't have any record of his death, when it was, or the manner of his death, or the location of his death whatsoever. But the, there are some, there's several. So the early church tradition says Peter probably died by crucifixion with his arms outstretched um, in AD 64, yeah, in 64 AD, um, in the Great Fire of Rome, under the, the term of Nero. So that's a general tradition, church tradition. Um, Tertullian, in, uh, in around 200, he says that uh, um, in one of his writings that Peter endured a passion like his Lord's in his work. In another work, he also uh, speaks of Peter's crucifixion, budding faith Nero first made bloody in Rome. So there are some early people that were in the church. They were a lot closer to it. I I'm, would not surprise me if people knew how Peter died and when he died. I mean, it would be a big topic when, when Peter got killed, I'm sure that it spread throughout all the churches that Peter had been killed or died, or and this is the manner by which. So the fact that they knew back then, even though it's not in Scripture, is possible, certainly so. Yep. Origen, um, in his commentary in the book of Genesis 3, quoted by Eusebius, um, said Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downwards, as he himself had desired to suffer. So crucified upside down, unlike the way the Lord was. So uh, Peter, uh, Peter of Alexandria, around who died in 311 AD, was Bishop of Alexandria, wrote an epistle on penance in which he says, Peter, the first of the apostles, having been often apprehended and thrown into prison and treated with ignominy, was last of all crucified at Rome. And then Jerome, one more I'll read here, uh, wrote that at Nero's hands, Peter received the crown of martyrdom being nailed to the cross with its head towards the ground and his feet raised on high, asserting that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. So those are certainly possible. They could have happened. It may not have happened too. It may be more a situation where it's like the, you know, the camel to the eye of the needle kind of thing, where somebody at one point in time said something and it sounded cool or whatever. And so it just caught on and it got spread. I, I, I found myself kicking against these more because of their assertion that he died in Rome. And then I know that the Roman Catholic Church uses that as part of their argument that he was the bishop of Rome, thus the, the, pontif, the pontiff Maximus, the, the top pope. Uh, and and I, I, I reject that. So, But this still could be true. And even if this is true, even if he was crucified in Rome, it still doesn't mean that he was the first pope. So... I always have to be careful on my own heart there because I want to kick against things and, and a magnitude that probably doesn't deserve. So what, are these things correct or true or not? Maybe, maybe not. Like I said, Peter did die at some point in time. And we read wonderful, he, he was converted for sure. For sure he was converted. And for sure he strengthens the brethren. Well, a couple other things that uh, are extra biblically spoken of, and I've mentioned this already. So the Roman Catholic belief is that Simon Peter was distinguished by Jesus to hold the first place of honor and authority. Also in Catholic belief, Peter was, as the first bishop of Rome, the first pope. Furthermore, they consider every pope to be Peter's successor and rightfully superior to all other bishops. So this is Roman Catholic doctrine. They have a couple scriptures and a lot of tradition that they use to, to wrestle this out. I think this is entirely wrong. There's no evidence that Peter was the authoritative apostle that, that all others bowed down. And, and if so, then who is Paul, the last of the apostles and the least of the apostles, to possibly correct Peter? And yes, they have little excuses and reasons for that. But nonetheless, 
So it's so nonetheless, this is one of the things that is Peter is used for, I believe, incorrectly. Another similar belief, the Mormons have a, a same a similar belief. So Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, recorded in multiple revelations that the resurrected Peter appeared to him and Oliver Cowdery in 1829 near Harmony Township in Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, in order to bestow the apostleship and keys of the kingdom as part of a restoration of priesthood authority. So here the Mormons also claim that Peter was the, the superior apostle and that it is only by secession through him that any church has authority. So in both cases here, these New Testament churches are attempting to take something from the law of Moses, i.e. the Levitical priesthood, and superimpose it upon the church, which does not belong there. There is no priestly hierarchy in the church that Jesus Christ founded. There are elders. There are people who are in, er, uh, in roles of authority and responsibility, but as servants, not as lords over people. So there's this whole idea of apostolic secession. So here's a little definition of that. Belief that the ministry of the church is held to be derived from the apostles by a continuous secession, which has usually been associated with a claim that the secession is through a series of bishops. As a result, claiming authority over the church is bestowed on those who are in the line of secession, not only excluding others, since they're not in that line, but elevates those who are as superior. So this is the idea of apostolic secession. And, and it's, right from, it's right from the Levitical priests. The, the high priests were the descendants of Aaron and his sons. No one else could be a high priest, except for maybe Zadok, but that's a different story. They were the high priests. The rest of the Levites could be priests. And in fact, all of the nation of Israel were priests in a sense, but only the sons of Aaron, by their birth, could be a high priest. That's the same thing they're doing here, except they're getting the bloodline out, and they're just talking about, well, Bob said Joe, said Sam, said Willie, said who that, you know, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. They, so I have the apostolic succession. There is no yeah, evidence. Now, yeah. both uh, right. Uh, right. The yes. The they, yep. So I think Scripture actually, clearly, not only does it not in any anywhere hint that such a thing exists in the New Testament church or in the Old Testament church, because it was just through bloodline then, so, but that it is spoken against. So we read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, for example. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you, were you baptized in the name of Paul? So now the topic here is baptism, and it seems that some people were like saying, oh, well, I was baptized by Peter. He's one of the apostles that walked with Jesus. You were just baptized by Bob, whatever that means, you know, whatever that. So, or I was baptized by Apollos, who was directly baptized by Paul. So that seems to be what's going on here. So what happens at baptism? That's when the hands get laid on. That's when you lay on the hands. So this is the same thing. Paul here is very specifically saying, that's all flesh. Get rid of that. That causes divisions. That means nothing whatsoever. Christ is not divided. It doesn't matter who baptized you. It doesn't matter whose hands were laid on you. It is the Spirit. We read here in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 through 25. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, Jesus, because he continues ever and has an unchangeable priesthood, whereof he is able to save them to the utmost, that come unto God by him 
seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. There is no longer an intermediary between God and man. There was for a while, God set it up that way. Levi was the one we were supposed to bring our sacrifices to. That's who we were supposed to, when we sinned and fell short, we were supposed to go to them and they would perform the task that would provide the propitiation for our sins. But here there is no, there is no authority, even though there are elders in, in each congregation that have a level of authority and responsibility, none of them are ones that anyone should go to because my, my relationship is severed with my Heavenly Father. If my relationship is severed with my Heavenly Father, I go directly to Him through the Son, period. Now, I may go to an elder or, or a fellow Christian and ask for advice, maybe, or clarification. I'm not sure I did this. I don't know. But nonetheless, there is no intermediary whatsoever. There needs to be absolutely no structure for man to interact directly with God. Now, he has set up the church because our frame is weak and he knows that we need help. And that if we were all out there on our own, we would be in trouble. So he has set up the church so that we can edify and strengthen each other and build each other up and correct each other when we fall short. But it is not so that he, well, he does not require the church as an entity so that he can interact or forgive mankind at all. None. Zero. So there is no need for a high priest other than Jesus himself, whom we already have. Hebrews 12, uh, 2a, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So not only did he scribe it and begin it, but he also is the one that brings it to fruition. And in Romans 8, verses 33 through 34, Paul says a similar thing. Nope, I went too far. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather than is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? It is Jesus and Jesus alone who is our high priests. So we do not need, so I just want to do a little side topic on the, the, the idea of apostolic secession, because that is something that people get caught up in. And, and I think to a certain extent, it's because much of what is considered Christendom today is just the wild, wild west, and people just kind of do whatever's right in their own eyes, and there is no, there is no authority whatsoever. And so everybody's, that's why we have all the divisions and denominations and differences amongst the Christians. And so people look on that. So some people look on that and say, well, the answer to that then is we need a pope to tell us what to do. I can understand that. I mean, I can, as, as a man, I can understand that desire. It's easy to, that's the desire that they had at the foot of Sinai. Give us some laws. Tell us what's right and what's wrong so we can do it. And then we can go to bed at night feeling good that we did it right. So I can understand. I don't, uh, that's why I always need to be careful um, when I have the opportunity to talk to someone on this topic, not to just jump on them, because th there could be some real sincerity and desire to serve God in there. And it's just one of the areas where they're weak and they've fallen short. So I talked about Peter and who he was. And then we talked a little bit about um, some of the extra biblical things that people have ascribed to Peter as far as how he died and some some assign a fair amount of significance to the manner of Peter's death, the traditional manner of Peter's death. And then we talked about the um, the idea of apostolic secession and how that seems to be anti-biblical. So one more thing I want to cover on this first part here. And that is, so that's who wrote these epistles, or who dictated these epistles, even though they were from God ultimately. But we understand the man that God used to bring them to us. So let's take a look briefly at his audience. Who was he writing to when he wrote these epistles? But we don't have to go too far. 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 2a. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and Bithynia, the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So that's who he's writing to. Strangers that are scattered around these areas, they are elect. That's who this letter is to. But who is that? What does that mean? 
well, first let's take a look. I like maps, so good opportunity to bring a little map up here. So nothing fancy, but so so we see here Pontius, you know, up kind of towards the top there. Galatia is a larger region in the mid up middle. Uh, Cappadocia is over to the right of it, and then Asia and Bithynia. So kind of the whole area there, just modern day Turkey. So that the area we would call Asia Minor, you know, the the Greek area. So the area that was mainly inhabited by Gentiles. There were Jews there, but it was Gentile. So where where did you got? So it was it more where did you got down into Syria and Cilicia and further down in Damascus? Those would be more Semitic people that would, in general, live in those areas, including Jews. So the fact that he writes this letter to that geographic region does that mean that since we live in America, we should not pay any attention to this letter? So certainly he did not write it directly to us. I, I imagine Peter probably did not know that his words would be preserved throughout the centuries the way they were. And this doesn't matter whether he did or not, but he probably didn't. I mean, it probably wasn't in his mind of like, you know, this is going to be around for a long time, like the prophet Jeremiah's writing for or whatever, but nonetheless. So, but what about somebody at, at the time when Peter wrote this that lived in Rome? Should would this letter not apply to them when they be prohibited from reading this letter or benefiting from it? No, of course not. That's a silly question. So just because he does specifically address these ge this geographic area, and this is the area that he is addressing, and it's intentional that he's doing that, but it does not exclude others, and it does not mean that there is not application for others. But he is, keep in mind that he is specifically singling out these geographic regions. Not to be mean. Now I bring that up because when we start looking at the other portion of who his audience is, people's hackles get raised up. So I'm going to do a little bit of a word study. We're going to start on some base words and we'll build up into words that are used in verse 1 there. So the first word that I want to talk about is uh, spiro. Um, and this is the word so. So and it's used 53 times um, in, the, in the Greek text that the King James Version is based on. And it's kind of scattered throughout the New Testament there. A couple examples that I have here on the screen, Matthew 13, 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 43, Paul uses it in a more metaphoric way. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. So sowing. So this, it's just planting. It's planting. So today... We generally, the way here in America, at least, you know, plants, we plant things like in nice rows and everything and stuff so that it's easier to maintain them and to harvest them. And that wasn't the case there. But this, so this base word here is just to plant. Really, it is just to plant. Now, the next word that this is used in, so one of the words that this is a base word in is diaspiro. And this means more to scatter. So this is more the image that we get. This is more the image that we get when we read the, the parable of the sower. It's like, well, some fell on hard ground. Some fell on the pavement. Some fell on, you know, stony ground. Some fell on good ground. So it's scattering around. But actually, sowing itself is just planting. So this is actually kind of planting by scattering. That's the method of planting. That this is. So this is scattering. And it's used three times in the New Testament. Uh, and I have two of them here on the on the screen as an example. I thought I had. Yeah. So uh, Acts 8, 1. And Saul was con consenting unto his death. And that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And skipping down to verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose upon Stephen traveled as far as to uh, Phidice, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So again, here this is so they're just being so it's just a word that means scattered. You're just scattered. So now there's another word that this is a root word of that we may be more familiar with, and that is diaspora. 
So it has the root of sow, in other words, they're planted, and it also has the root of scattered, they're planted by being scattered, that's the method that they are planted or sown. But this one here is specific in that diaspora applies to specifically a people group, the Israelites that were scattered. So anywhere, so the diaspora only shows up three times in the New Testament. I have two of them on the screen here. John 7, 35, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that he sh we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? So this is the word diaspora or diaspora. So this is, he's talking about the Jews that are scattered amongst the Gentiles. And then in James 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. Again, the 12 tribes, it's the Jews, the, the Israelites that, that are scattered abroad throughout the Gentile world that these are, these are addressing. And there's, there's one other, there's one other place where the aspera is used, and it is in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So it's this word here. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout the diaspora, the diaspora that is in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he is writing to the Israelites that are amongst these Gentile nations, the Gentile areas that he names here. Right, Asia Minor. So now... The fact that he is writing to the Israelites, does that disclude the Gentiles? Does he mean, well, no, you're not, you can't? Uh-uh, Gentiles, stop, don't read this in front of Gentiles. Of course not, absolutely not. But he is specifically addressing the Jews. And we read in a couple places, but Paul uh, elucidated it really good in, in Galatians chapter 3, where it seemed like that the, the ministry of the circumcision, the Jews was given unto Peter, and to the Gentiles was given unto Paul. Although we know in both cases, Peter was actually the first one to go to a Gentile. And Paul, his first act always when he would go into a city would be to go to the Jews first. And then once he had shared what he could there and they no longer would listen to him, then he would withdraw and stay with the Gentiles. So in the same fashion here, Peter is addressing this letter to the Jews. Now, I believe there's a real specific and subtle reason that Peter does that, and it's because many, especially in the first epistle, there are many places where Peter uses terms that would have a connotation or a meaning to the Jews, and he flips it around, and he does it for one specific purpose every single time. It is to illustrate the point that he mentioned in Acts 15 that your salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your heritage as physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not in any way talking bad about them. He is not elevating them up either. But he uses terms, and we'll, uh, as we go through the letter, I'll point these out, in, in a way that continues to illustrate that point. So there's one, so let's, uh, one other piece that's in verse one, and it's strangers. So we have the region of uh, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We have the, the, the diaspora, those are who are scattered, and now we have strangers. So just a real quick, that, that word only shows up three times in the New Testament, um, and it means someone essentially who is resident of another land living in a foreign land. Pretty straightforward. But this is the first example that Peter uses where the term strangers to the Jew always meant the other nations. So this is one. And what does he go on to say here? Actually, let me read a couple examples here real quick. Deuteronomy 23, verse 20a, unto a stranger you may lend upon usury. So you can charge interest to a stranger, but you can't to your brethren. Exodus 12, 43, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover, there shall no stranger eat of. So the, these are words that are clearly, you're, you're Israelite, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, strangers are all the other people. In uh, Deuteronomy 10, 19, he says, Live therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, but they're not strangers anymore, they're nigh unto God. God came into covenant with them and at the foot of Sinai, and they are no longer strangers. So in... First Peter chapter 1, 
Peter does that exactly. He uses that word and he calls he, he calls the, the diaspora, the Israelites, strangers. And why does he do that? Because they are strangers from God in the sense of salvation in the same way that all Gentiles are. So in verse, uh, verse 2, he goes on to say, he says here, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Not because you are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are no longer strangers. No. Strangers in the sense that you need to be reconciled to God by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's going to do this with terms several times throughout his epistle. So that's why I think it's it was worth time to belabor the point that even though he was not excluding other geographic regions, and even though he is not in any way excluding Gentiles, this epistle is written in a manner that is specifically addressed so that the Jews will understand his message. It's the same message that he said to the, to the whole congregation in Acts 15. Let me get back, if I can get back to that here. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So that the, so Peter, in, in the fact that he addressed in his opening salutation the letter to the Israelites, does it in a way that makes it inclusive of all who believe. And he makes it clear time and time again in his epistle that we'll go through in the following parts, that it is the same for all mankind. And, and I think it is amazing the way he doesn't have to, he doesn't use language at all that even anybody can consider as being belittling to the Jews. Some people could take and twist Paul's words and say, Paul's talking bad about the Jews. No, he's not. Paul doesn't talk bad about the Jews. He talks bad about those who want to justify themselves. Absolutely. Just as Jesus did to the Pharisees. And he called them hypocrites. But this is the same Peter that couldn't seem to speak two sentences without tripping over his own tongue before he was converted. And yet now, by the Spirit, God has used him in incredible ways. So I'm really excited to go through the rest. So I just got one closing slide here. Um, I'll close it out with some words out of Peter's second epistle here. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God? So while I believe that this uh, has been a very worthwhile and, and fruitful topic and set of verses to go through, ultimately, really all we need, we don't need to know all the little minutiae. We don't need to know that. We need to know some very simple things, that God is not a respecter of persons, and that all who turn to him and ask for mercy, he eagerly outstretches his hand and provides it and will redeem. Peter goes on to say, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So, Peter is an excellent example of a servant of God and an excellent example to me of what God will is eager and willing and able to do to anyone who will set aside their own life and receive his spirit and obey him and be guided by him. So I pray that's true for all of us, brothers and sisters. Godspeed. And we'll be back next week. And we got like, what is it? Uh, let me end the recording here.